pride of the nation. Me and Dominique the Prima go way back. Tight, smiley, making sure the station stays black. Discussing all the issues in our community. We're hosting black and brown and others find unity. So let's talk about it. Maybe we can improve it. Digital underground, always down with the movie. So we tune in. The first things first with the queen of black talk radio. Dominique the Prima. Go, sis. KBLA Talk 1580. Good morning and God bless. I'm Dominique DePrima. This show is called First Things First and my first thing every single day, giving thanks, giving praise, asking for blessings from the Most High, asking for the blessings of the ancestors and the elders and getting it going. We do have a lot to talk about. I know I say that every day, but it's extra, extra today. I hope you guys know the deal. If you're new, welcome, welcome in. Um, hour one, we go local, the left coast, California, and parts around here. Hour two, we go national, international, and beyond. And in the third hour, we do typically a deep dive on a topic or with a person of interest. Today um, is no exception, uh, and we'll have a little extra something-something with some information about an amazing basketball event uh, as part of our um, second hour, along with a check-in from Dr. Melina Abdullah, who will update us on the actions of the L.A. City Council regarding the LAPD on yesterday. And she's got a lot to say about that. Hour three, we'll be hearing from Dr. Regina Lark. Her book is Emotional Labor, Why a Woman's Work is Never Done and What to Do About It. All of the unpaid burdens that we as uh, women carry around and how we can learn to be paid for our work or let it go. Looking forward to that conversation. I think uh, <laughs> I'm definitely um, a candidate to learn and benefit from that book. All right. Um, and right now, though, we have we have a different angle on the local. And that's because, you know, some, so many times we focus on the city of Los Angeles and we forget about parts east, parts west, parts south. Uh, we don't forget. We just don't amplify as much as we could and should. And today we will do just that. In fact, I think we're doing a bit of that this week because on Friday, Attorney Carrie Harper will be with us in the 8 o'clock hour to talk about the Winco case. Ooh, crazy developments there, right? The member, the woman that was thrown down in front of the Winco. Um, and today we'll be focusing, and she also has a case in Pasadena, so we'll have some information um, there as well. And today we're focusing on parts east for a minute, and there's a whole lot to unpack in this conversation. Uh, you know this guy; he's almost a he's like a unofficial contributor <laughs> to KBLA. He's a journalist, a producer, a film documentarian, and a member of the National Association of Black Journalists. He's host of the award-winning show, The Conversation Live. It's a talk show, and he has columns on race, race and social justice in the L.A. Progressive. James Farr, welcome back. Good morning, Dominique. Thank you so much for having me here this morning. Absolutely. Live and in studio, so jump on the YouTubes. It's YouTube.com, KBLA 1580, and you can see us. Uh, and we're looking kind of fancy today, so in case you care about stuff like that, you should be quite happy. Joined by another guest um, who has, um, I'm sure, quite a few details that he can fill in for us. He's a 2020... Um, uh, C-A-A-L-A, -A -A, Trial Lawyer of the Year finalist. He's principal and lead attorney at Romero Law, a litigator who served as a staff instructor, um, and he has been rated AV preeminent by Martindale Hubble, having been ranked at the highest level of professional ex excellence for his legal expertise. Attorney Alan Romero, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Let me get that mic just a little closer. You gotta uh, talk like it's a, like you're a rapper. I always say you got it. <laughs> so, 
you know, let's not bury the lead, James. Um, we know about the L.A. County Sheriff gangs. We do. We've heard murmurings about the possibility of LAPD gangs. We but have. never have I heard about police gangs in Pasadena. Well, I don't think that that should be a surprise to you, Dominique. Should be a surprise to any of uh, your listening audience. Um, culture per- permeates, right? If if it's working in one system, uh, it's very likely that it will show up in others. And uh, I've been tracking uh, this case and this incident uh, for quite some time, and it's just now coming to light uh, through a lawsuit that was filed by uh, Mr. Romero on behalf of his client, Lieutenant Sammy De Silva, who I might add is, you know, when you think about, and this is going to be a, a different spin, right? Like, I don't normally come here talking positively about some of the good things that officers do in community, right? Sammy's Although, a, to be fair, when they do good things, it should be recognized. Ab- I have no problem with that whatsoever. A- absolutely. He's, uh, De Silva's that officer in the community. He's, he's the, the guy that uh, community members can trust, feel safe with. He's fair. You know, 27-year career in this department. And believe it or not, he's the former president of the Peace Off- Pasadena Police Officers Association. So it's hmm, Yeah, a that's wonder. a tough one for me because for me, most of those police associations are pretty much cartels. Perhaps, and you know, perhaps that there there there's some validity to that, right? And and I wouldn't argue. But I know you're story. a big Virgo, big Virgo energy here, so you're going to have every detail of this case if you're following <laughs> it, and that's what we want. So, you're saying the guy has that community policing, he has that uh, community relationship, mm-hmm. and former uh, police association president. Well, I think what's interesting in that, if we if we kind of carve that out. Who better knows what's going on in this department than the former president of the Police Officers Association? So the fact that he has come forward with uh, very, very strong allegations and, you know, the the assault that he suffered uh, at the hands of another lieutenant, the harassment, the discrimination, all of those are bad in and of itself, right? They're horrible. And in fact, you know, the assault should have... Uh, been criminally referred over to the district attorney. It's what he's uncovered in terms of these financial crimes and fraud involving the use of public funds. That's something that I think is really going to be a watershed moment, Uh, will potentially open up the department to even more scrutiny and possible federal level investigation. Um, And so you know, we, Pasadena is not like any other city. A lot of folks think the police keep us safe, right? That's just an idea. You mean a lot of folks in Pasadena? A lot of folks in Pasadena. Got it, right? got it, yeah. But, you know, in, in community, folks north of the 210, there's a 30, 40 year history of police uh, heavy handedness, police killings, uh, police. Um, you know, botching up investigations on homicides. I mean, there's just a trough of information and I'm working to bring all of that forward in the, in the coming stories in LA progressive. Attorney Romero, you, um, I see in your bio here, you're a board certified behavior analyst analyst, which is really interesting. Um, I, you know, it sounds random, but what we're talking about here is, uh, it's relevant to this case, right? I would think because, what I've seen, at least it, with the sheriff's department, a lot of times these kinds of issues, whether it's gang, um, law enforcement gangs, or internal corruption, come to light when officers sue fellow officers and or the department that they're working for. Yes, and there's a you know very strong behavioral element to that. And what happens is you have individuals who are within the organization who support and protect the organization, and at some point something happens and they have to make an internal decision, an internal calculus, that this has gone too far, that they can't get any remedy within the department, within administrative means, and they have to go externally and speak to someone like me and file a lawsuit and hope that the courts will afford them the justice that the departments have denied them. And, I mean, when when uh, De Silva came to you with this case, what was your reaction? Disbelief, of course. These are pretty, you know, egregious you know, allegations, uh, allegations of egregious conduct within the department, and we, we verified them to the best extent we could. And some of the allegations made 
you know, such as a officer on officer violence on duty that was essentially ratified by the department, you, they're not going to be able to talk their way out of that one. That one kind of, uh, you know, made the decision for us in terms of filing. Mm. And when you, I mean, when, when you talk about, you know, these types of lawsuits, I think one of the things that we, at least we hear from law enforcement, is this is just a disgruntled employee, somebody mad they didn't get a promotion, somebody mad they were not, you know, in with the cool kids. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm going back to your behavior analyst mm -hmm. hat and also your attorney hat. What makes you confident that's not the case? This is not just guy, some guy mudslinging. Well, as with most slander, there's an element of truth to it. There's a kernel of truth. Are these people, you know, not getting promotions? Well, yes, because they're whistleblowers and they're being retaliated against. Are these people not part of the cool kids group? Well, absolutely, because people who stand up and take a stand in favor of justice, in favor of the community, and against their department are ostracized. Friends that have been lifelong friends don't talk to them anymore. Their careers are over. Their friendships are over to a large extent. Their, their lives are over. And I have to look at that in the larger context of whether or not this is a believable claim, whether or not we have probable cause to bring a lawsuit in Superior Court. And this is one that I felt very strongly about. I felt very strongly about our client, that I believed him. And I think the fact that you know, he was assaulted on duty by another cop and effectively nothing happened to that officer. If you or I assaulted someone at work, we'd be fired on the spot. If you or I assaulted a police officer, we'd be charged criminally. None of that happened here. Hmm. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the granular details of what's happening in this case specifically and what are the implications uh, for the department as a whole. We'll look at that when we come forward with attorney Alan Romero and uh, journalist James Farr, only on KBLA Talk 1580. More of First Things First with Dominique DePrima when we come forward. Your ancestors' favorite radio station, radio station. and your favorite morning show host. Let's get back to Dominique DePrima right now. Right now. Right now, we are back to Dominique DePrima along with journalist James Farr and attorney uh, Alan Romero, and they're live in studio, KBLA. Uh, 1580 on YouTube. If you want to see us, love to invite you in. We're talking about what's happening uh, with the Pasadena Police Department in general and this specific, uh, would you, uh, Attorney Romero, would you categorize this as a whistleblower case? This is a quintessential whistleblower case by an officer against his department. So what exactly happened? Give me the, you know, well, the, the, the basics of the story. The basics is we have a gentleman, Sam De Silva. I met him years ago. He's a very community involved officer, a great guy, and he came back to me and he said, uh, I've got a story for you. And the story was effectively that two things primarily. One, that he was assaulted at work, that he was kicked in the knee by a superior officer. It resulted in an injury where he had to have knee surgery and that superior officer was not being punished and that the same superior officer, a uh, lieutenant by the name of Russo, was engaged in large-scale fraud and theft and misuse of public funds, and they report these things to the department, the department effectively did nothing. There were approximately five internal affairs investigations into this Russo, but because he was a part of an alternative power structure within the department known as the good old boys club, that effectively he was shielded from prosecution, even though De Silva wanted this uh, office lieutenant prosecuted, and he was shielded and, and held immune and effectively for all the fraud and theft and assaulting another officer, resulting in great bodily injury, got a 40-hour suspension, which is basically a week off of work as a result. Alternative power structure. Is that like alternative facts? Uh, it's, um, and, and when you say good old boys, what is that? So two-part question. So the first part is that uh, alternative power structure is the best term that I can come up to to represent the fact that in these departments, the people who are the chief and who are supposed to be in charge aren't always in charge. There are people, sometimes it's gangs and departments, sometimes it's a power structure like we have here in Pasadena, where there are mostly white males, almost exclusively white males, who dictate who will be promoted, who will get certain assignments, and who will be punished, and who will be immune for acts of violence on the street. And that's what we have here. And the good old boys? The good old boys is what the officers, primarily African-American officers and minor, uh, officers of color, such as our client, refer to this alternative power structure within the Pasadena Police Department. They've been known by that term, the good old boys club, for 
you know, 20, 30 years. Because that's, you know, that's one of those terms we hear thrown around. Um, James Farr, you have spent a lot of time as a journalist covering the Pasadena Police Department. Tell me what's different about this case. What's what's different about this case, first of all, is that it did come forward. Um, and that's, as, as we were saying earlier, you don't typically see that. But, uh, you know, I, I'm exploring the idea. I mean, gang is one thing. I know Alan may not necessarily agree with that definition. You know, it seems more like an organized crime syndicate, kind of shadowy. That's what gangs are. Well, you know. Okay, is the mafia a gang? If they weren't Italian, they would be. Well, I mean, or Irish. I don't know. I, I'm not an expert l- l- language, on Language, right? Right. It's, it's language. You know, we glorify right. organized crime. Right. It's we, like the former sheriff of L.A. said they were cliques. Cliques, or right. They're not really gangs. They're social they're, clubs. They're cliques. But, but, but from my understanding, I mean, just what I know of gangs, which I'm not claiming to be an expert, but I've been in the peace, urban peace movement sure. for a long time. And as far as I know, clica is another name for gang. Sure. Sure. It's, I mean, it's, it's, and Alan and I have, uh, as I have interviewed others and, and subject experts on this, you know, you explore the idea <laughs> that this is a, a parallel power structure. So right. while the, whatever you want to yeah, call right, it, right, right. Yeah, so yeah. while, while the leadership may not self identify as a clique, or they're gang, never going to self identify. Right. Oh, we're a criminal enterprise. We're, we're a gang. Who's going to say that unless you're literally a blood or a crip? Right. No one's going to say that. Right. Right. Or, you know, Mexican mafia. I don't even know if they consider themselves a gang. Who knows? Right. But we see, you know, when we look at the uh, independent report and investigation to the Anthony McLean um, case, which we talked about here on your show some time ago. Yes, we did. And it now provides a lot more context to it's not just an idea that things may be happening within the department now you kind of have a a road map if you will of how an, uh, an investigation can show up uh, artificial kind of rushed insufficient um, we see officers in the last few years who have been uh, stopped by other law enforcement agencies flat out intoxicated and drunk. We've seen officers bail from their vehicle, display weapons, leave their minor child. I mean, we could go on and on and on about incidents where at the public may say, well, why do these guys or ladies still have a job? Just recently, we saw officers in our department caught drinking. Yeah, I on remember the job, the, right? It was a videotape, right? It was a videotape, It was like right. some kind of barbecue or something. You sent me that. Yeah, and so, you know, I I had invited, the last time I was here, I was expecting to have a sit down with our police chief, and he blew through the stop sign and didn't show up. So right. there doesn't seem this urgency, right? And yeah. per, let's say perhaps the chief didn't know, right? He's new. He's just finding out what's going right, on. Right, because you guys get a new police chief every week we over do. there. We do. Yeah. We do. And so perhaps he's been advised and informed by members of this good old boys club, which uh, De Silva articulates in his lawsuit. And he may not be having all of the information, but, you know, this is a 30 year practice of officers in leadership positions and so the what, what makes you say pasadena police department has a 30-year practice of uh, this kind of discrimination i'll call it gang activity if you won't clicks clicks corrupt violent social clubs i mean we we, we 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 could go as far back as michael zinzan losing his eye to pasadena police officers we can go contemporarily to the anthony mclean investigation and every stop in between um you know, officers who should have never been in a uniform. And then once they're in that uniform, certain things happen and they are protected. Yeah. Um, the police chief, Eugene Harris, of course, you know, he's not going to say there's even if he does have all the information to me, this is a, a, a bit of a quandary in these kinds of cases, because if a police chief or a uh, sheriff says, oh, yeah, we have a gang problem in our department. They immediately lose the rank and file, right? Essentially, yes, that's what happens. Usually you've seen, especially in the sheriff's department, I've been heavily involved in litigation against the sheriff's department, that any criticism of the organization will absolutely do that, eliminate the support of the rank and file. When you're a sheriff, for example, that cuts off a lot of the f- fundraising and political support. 
So essentially, in any organization, any politically powerful organization, there is an inherent need and compulsion to protect the entity. And it's, it's self-defense, and it's, it's harmful to the community. But yes, that's exactly what happens. I mean, I remember uh, our former <clears throat> sheriff here, Villanueva, saying, oh, there are no gangs, but I've eliminated them, yeah. you know, which is, I don't have a drug problem, but I've gone to rehab. It doesn't make any sense. But on the other hand, you know, how uh, our current sheriff, and this is just an example because it's a parallel kind of situation, our uh, Sheriff Luna is saying he's set up a task force, you know, to uh, look into the sheriff gangs, but yet we can't apparently compel them to show us whether or not they have tattoos. So how do you, and, and really this is for both, um, you know, uh, Attorney um, Romero and journalist Farr, how do you get any kind of accountability from inside these structures when leadership is, in fact, more or less, you know, their hands tied? Well, what some in the community have asked for is the Department of Justice, an outside agency. Even our former mayor, uh, Bill Preparian, five years ago said on my program that it is time for a federal investigation uh, to come into the department. In this case, you know, Chief Harris, his response is a canned response, which is, you know, for some it's a dog whistle. For others, they may say he's circling the wagon. But to publicly say anything less than I'm open to a public, uh, excuse me, a federal investigation, uh, someone else coming in with fresh eyes. But his response has been, I'm going to basically we're going to self-investigate these in allegations and so what that says is the good old boys club is going to investigate the good old boys club in the tradition of daryl gates we've got news traffic and sports right now and then continue the conversation uh interested to hear what the new mayor says and more on kbla talk 1580 she's reclaiming her time on kbla talk 1580 more first things first with dominic de prima when we come forward Thanks for waking up with Dominique De Prima on KBLA Talk 1580. Do appreciate you. I'm James Farr of The Conversation Live, and the L.A. Progressive is with us. Attorney Alan Romero. Hey, I'm I'm honored a fifth-generation Angelino who's a descendant of Aztec Emperor Montezuma. That's pretty dope um, on your mom's side. Uh, you know, that's the ancestors are in the studio for sure right now. Um so we're talking about the Pasadena Police Department and the case that you brought um, on behalf of uh, Sammy De Silva, who is a former lieutenant. Or is he currently still a lieutenant? Yes. He's still a lieutenant. Mm, tricky. Um, so I asked James, how do we ever get accountability if, you know, the, the sheriffs, the police chiefs are always going to dodge these questions and say, as uh, this chief said, oh, there's no evidence of gang activity. Because otherwise, they're, you know, they're going to be Willie Williams. They're going to be toast as far as um, fellow officers and any credibility with rank and file. So how do we get accountability? Well, the simple answer is the only path to justice is through civil litigation, through attorneys like myself and working with community partners such as yourself and with Mr. Farr. We have to file these cases and through civil discovery, obtain documents such as a document, uh, I internal affairs investigation from the Sheriff's Department, which confirmed the existence of the executioner's gang in Compton that they were engaged in racketeering at the station. But what happens, we talked about doublespeak, we had who now under Sheriff April Tardy, who testified at the uh, Community Oversight Commission that yes, there's a gang, yes, they're engaged in racketeering, and then a few months later at trial said, that wasn't true, uh, I don't know where that came from, and none of that's true. There is no gang, there is no racketeering. Be she was able to do that because there's no repercussions. When police officers, especially police officers in authority positions lie on the stand, they're not held accountable. They're not fired. They're actually rewarded and promoted as uh, under Sheriff Tardy was. Why? I mean, why are there no repercussions? Is it the police officer's bill of rights? Is it just we look the other way, a wink and a smile? Like, why? Why are there no repercussions? My personal opinion, based on my personal experience, is that the courts will not hold these people accountable. Whenever there's a tie in court and it's not clear who's telling the truth, the judges will almost exclusively err on the side of caution and give the benefit of the doubt to the police. And they'll say in court, why would the sheriff lie? Why would this deputy lie? Right. I mean, so it's it's almost like a, a de facto extension of qualified immunity. Like you get, you get a pass. 
if yep. you're law enforcement. Yes, I, in, in fact, in courts. Absolutely. And I've had judges come after me and say, uh, you know, Romero brings hoax cases. There are no gangs in the sheriff's department. Meanwhile, the legislature has, has passed uh, Penal Code 13670 outlawing law enforcement gangs. Someone, a deputy at Compton, pleaded guilty to racketeering charges, federal charges, but I'm the one that's retaliated against for bringing the cases. And and not to mention the whole report coming out of Loyola Marymount University, which clearly documents. And even the, the, the video we were talking about, James, where they're they're drinking while in uniform. I mean, it looks like they're at a cookout, you know, but no, no consequences, right? Well, because of the protections of the Peace Officers' Bill of Rights and personnel issues, uh, the public generally doesn't know, right? So even if you and I know, find out through a source, through media, we could report it all day long, but the department itself will never confirm what an actual disciplinary action is. And so we see... So we can say we don't know if they've been disciplined, but they're still on the job, right? Th- yeah, they're clearly still still on the job. What, what Picture we, me... Okay, yeah. Yeah, Picture, it, it doesn't work like that in any I other... I mean, I know some air personalities do drink on the job, so maybe that's not a good... <laughs> uh, but anything where you're holding a deadly weapon, you know, and driving a vehicle... In, in that instance, I mean, it was... Driving our vehicles, right? It's officers. Gun safety one-on-one is you probably shouldn't drink or do drugs while you are in possession of a gun, right? But the fact that they took time out of their shift, we don't know. And because the department won't fully be transparent as to what the discipline is and, and what other things were violated, we don't know. Did they take themselves out of service? You know, officers, officers. LOL. often complain about, <laughs> you know, staff shortage, shortages, right? right? These are all real things yeah. that they present to us to increase that 5% uh, budget yeah. increase, yeah. right? Yeah. We yeah. need more, we need more, we need more. But here we are, they, they've taken themselves out of service. They're drinking on the job. They're slamming shots of tequila. And then they have to go out and have contact with the public the rest of the night. So not only does is that a public safety issue, it also puts other cases, anything that they potentially touch that night could be contaminated. Right. And speaking of the constant crying about needing more money for the budget, part of what came to light through this whistleblower case of, of Sam De Silva is actually financial corruption and we and we have seen that in other departments where um you know overstating the number of hours worked or exaggerating uh you know the work that was done in order to get more money from grants from uh the budget these uh these cases i read about pretty frequently across the country whether it's through seizure of goods that then you know go to underwrite uh, a department, or whether it's through um, overstating hours, it, it's something I see with some frequency. Another example, and I'll get back to Patsy in a moment, was in Compton. One of my cases uncovered widespread uh, overtime fraud by members of the executioner's deputy gang in Compton. No one was punished. There was no ramifications. The city of Compton, a very impoverished city, their taxpayers paid for hundreds of thousands of hours, uh, hun- sorry, hundreds of thousands of dollars and hours of overtime by detectives, which never took place. The only net result was the shot caller of the group, a gentleman by the name of Jaime Juarez, got a promotion. My whistleblower was demoted. Pasadena, same thing. Sam De Silva uncovered tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of misuse of public funds for DUI checkpoints when the officers were being paid to man the checkpoints from state funds. That never happened. They would hang out and socialize at the department, watch videos, socialize with Russo, there was effectively no consequences for this. These funds were never paid back because there's no accountability. Sheriff's Department passing the PD, most police departments in this country, it's it's sad but true. Meanwhile, I, I mean, you look at L.A., we just gave a 13% in, uh, raise to, to the LAPD, and they're taking up a quarter of the, the general fund. And if there's that kind of fraud going on, financial fraud, we could certainly save taxpayers some dollars let's go to ronnie calling us from orange county good morning sir hi good morning dominique and good morning to your guests um any thoughts or questions when i listened just now had been answered so i'm going to just be very specific you know in orange county we had a sheriff on uh citizen and sheriff on sheriff shooting at cook's corner uh, which is about 10 miles from where I live. 
the news agencies bent over backwards last night um, to say, this is a good place. Uh, we don't have uh, these problems here. And, Dominique, you know I call in regularly and speak about the uh, shootings, the mass shootings in Orange County because they're underreported. But that's not my question. I could get to my question quickly. Okay, go ahead. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the um, Yesterday, uh, he did answer my question about uh, filing documents on the uh, sheriffs and the PDs. Um, my reason for calling was I felt that we need to use a black press just like we did it with Emmett Till to get the uh, truth out, okay, and continue reporting it and repeatedly reporting it. Dominique, in a past radio life with you, I continue to talk about steroids. This sheriff yeah. yesterday went looking for his wife. Yeah, I, and I, and it's a question that I've heard brought up by people with more knowledge of what goes on in these departments than I have. Um, you know, we'll, we'll continue this conversation we, when we come forward. Should we have drug testing for deputies and police officers, especially when they are involved with shootings or fraudulent activity, and in particular steroids, because we all know what a roid rage is, and um, yeah, this is something. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Talk about. KBLA Talk 1580 reminding you that we keep us safe. The Center for the Pacific Asian Family was founded to help address domestic violence and sexual assault in the Asian and the Pacific Islander communities. The Center for the Pacific Asian Family's mission is to build healthy and safe communities by addressing the root causes and consequences of family violence and violence against women. They are committed to meeting the specific cultural and language needs of the Asian and Pacific Islander women and their families. CPAF's vision is of an Asian and Pacific Islander community that embraces healthy relationships and works in partnership with other communities to eradicate all forms of violence. To access services, volunteer, or for more info, visit nurturingchange.org. At KBLA Talk 1580, we believe believe everyone deserves to be safe. This is a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. Heard any other talk radio lately that sounds anything like this? We didn't think so. You're listening to Unapologetically Progressive KBLA Talk 1580. Talking about uh, what's going on with the Pasadena Police Department, feel like I've talked about it over the years with various cases. Um, and Attorney Carrie Harper will be joining us Friday, not just uh, she'll be talking about the, the throwdown case at the Winco, but also um, some of her work in the city of Pasadena. So, you know, I, I asked you what accountability looks like in court. James Farr, I mean, you've been covering Pasadena Police Department and their shenanigans, uh, sometimes in conjunction with the Altadena Sheriff's Department. Uh, should they be under a consent decree? Do you think they should be under a federal consent decree? I raised that same question to our mayor in that same interview, and he said no. Mm. I he want said no. <laughs> what do you say, Attorney Romero? I have mixed feelings. To a certain extent, I feel local governments should be responsible for their own mm -hmm. affairs. But on the other hand, you know, I brought court. I brought cases in the LA Superior Court, and the judges refused to hold the department accountable with respect to the executioner's gang in Compton. And it took the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington D.C. to come out here and indict and get conviction, at least one conviction for racketeering against a member of the group, because local judges were one particular judge in particular refused to allow any accountability whatsoever. The community is asking for a consent decree at this point. There, mm. there, There's zero confidence. Yeah. Well, it has been completely I'll join eroded. them in that. I don't see how you could, if you've got a pattern, what appears to be a pattern in practice of malfeasance, of fraud, of violence, harassing witnesses. I mean, I've, t I've interviewed attorney Carrie Harper. I've interviewed a couple of your police chiefs over the years. And to me, it seems like there's a recurring issue in a relatively small city. I don't see why. I don't see how else you get any kind of accountability. Not much has changed. I mean, I'll tell you a story. You know, 25, 30 years ago, I got snatched up off the street by passing a PD, and they accused me of being a drug dealer. Wow. That wrong description just because of the color of my skin. So passing a PD has a long history of, let's say, racial insensitivity. Mm. Time flies when you're on the radio. 
Um, tell us how to keep track of you and your work, James Farr. You can read me over at the uh, L.A. Progressive. This story will be out later on today. Twitter at James Farr Live and uh, website at James Farr Live. You'll find all my, my handles. L.A. Progressive, full of great stories. Um, what do you want to leave us with this morning, Attorney Romero? I'm here, so I went to law school to do. I'm so happy. I get to work with great people, meet great people like yourself, my clients, my staff, and uh, I feel blessed to do this work, and I uh, couldn't be happier. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you could be richer, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm just saying, when you do civil rights, it comes with a lot of other stuff, right? It comes with a certain amount of harassment, a certain amount of exposure. Uh, I've lost a couple million dollars the last couple years doing these cases, but I best money I ever spent. Um, 30 seconds James what do you want to leave us with I want people to especially in Pasadena right to pay attention to their department to ask the mayor to ask the council Um, and and it's not just as they say it's the same old people It's, it's folks outside of our community that need to be better aware of the corruption the culture the existence of uh, evilness sometimes within our departments uh, in Pasadena and in many other agencies. It's real. It's not made up. And my, my phrase of the day, alternative power structure. Whoa. Whoa. Think about that for a second. Uh, journalist James Farr and attorney uh, Romero, thank you so much for joining us this morning. You're lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. And we continue our conversations. We have so much going on today. About to Give you something to smile about, a little basketball for your weekend. That's coming up on KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA 1580 Santa Monica. I'm Mike Moore.